Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, pastor is here. <laughs> but I coerced her by twisting her arm and letting you make announcements this morning. So uh, I hope it didn't hurt you too much. <laughs> so uh, thank all of you who wish me a happy birthday. I appreciate that. Um, but I'm not <laughs> big things, I got a really great birthday present. Uh, my wife, who will turn 65 shortly, was able to enroll in Medicare. I have her only enrolled in Medicare, so... <laughs> also, yesterday was a big anniversary. It was the 60th anniversary of the 29th birthday of Shirley Shine. <laughs> so extend your birthday wishes to Ron, who will pass them on to Shirley, I'm sure. <laughs> Shirley, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, a reminder to all of you that there is an annual meeting after church, immediately after, well, not almost immediately after church today. Please stay so that we have a forum for that. There is a blood drive Wednesday, and for those of you who uh, come to the Pastor's Bible study on Wednesday. It is not canceled. It will be on Wednesday, but it will probably be here in the sanctuary. I make note, please, that uh, Mr. Robert Ray is going to be doing a men's Bible study on Thursdays. Please contact Bob Bob, if any of you gentlemen are interested in doing that. Um, I was told that uh, somebody, whose name I won't mention, does no longer wants to harp about uh, Apple Fest. You can guess who that person might be. <laughs> but just a reminder to all you ladies that, you know, Apple Fest is coming up. And for all of you who want to make donations to Apple Fest through baskets or baked goods or soup, please, uh, please do so. And I'm sure that the person whose name I didn't mention will be more than happy to uh, accept all those donations. <laughs> Pastor, I don't want to talk anymore. Believe it or not. <laughs> that works. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Ben. So for our Advent study this year, we're going to be doing the Christmas letters. So we've got them in. So if you guys are interested, when we start to prepare to do that, you're going to want to get your own copy of the Christmas letters. Um, I'll have this available so that you guys can and pick it up either through Cokesbury, um, Christian Book, or Amazon as well. Sounds good. Thank you, Ben. The author is Matt Gray de Vega. M-A-G-R-E-Y de Vega. There you go. Any others? Then we begin our worship. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin and come to God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need. Turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation, and by the glory of the cross you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. first reading is from Isaiah 50. The image of the servant of the Lord is one of the notable motifs of the book of Isaiah. Today's reading describes the mission of the servant, whom early Christians associated with Jesus. Like Jesus, the servant does not strike back at his detractors, but trusts in God's steadfast love. The word of God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he awakens, wakens my ear to listen as those whom are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. 
who will declare me guilty? The word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 116. I will walk in the presence of the Lord. The The love, I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I call. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought low, and God saved me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt with you. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. Our second reading is from James chapter 3. This text uses various images to illustrate how damaging and hurtful the way we speak to and about others can be. Not only are we to control our speech, but what we say and how we say it are to reflect our faith. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will, <clears throat> excuse me, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It slains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For very... For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, they can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine fig? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. According to Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Jesus asked them, 
But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in, his, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated, and it's time for the children's message. So I think I saw JJ out there. You're going to come up? Come on up. Get your seat. How are you today? Good? I like your Crocs, and look at your, I forget, what do they call those? The buttons that you put on them? Is that what they're called, buttons? I don't know either. There you go. Hey, did you ever hear, when I was a little girl, people used to say this to me all the time, when people were being mean to me, my mom and dad especially would say, now listen, Jamie, sticks and stones will break your bones. But names will never hurt you. Did you ever hear that? Yeah. Well, do you want me to tell you something that's really true? Names will hurt you. They will really hurt you sometimes, won't they? When people call us names, it hurts a whole lot. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names also hurt me. And, and that is really interesting because in the second lesson that Mr. Ben read today, he was talking about how our tongues can sometimes get us in trouble by saying things that aren't always helpful, right? So I want to do an experiment with you, okay? Okay, you hold this plate for me. I got this tube of toothpaste, anti-cavity, of course. Yes, here we go. I brought this tube of toothpaste, and I am going to squirt this tube of toothpaste. Ah, oh, ooh, there you go. I'm going to try to get it all out. Okay, I think I got it pretty much all out. Maybe a little bit more. Let's see. Eh, pretty much. Just one more dollop. Okay. Now, I'll hold this, and I want you to put this toothpaste back in the tube. <laughs> think you can do it? I couldn't do it. <laughs> well, you know what? The same kind of thing happens when we call people names and when they say unkind things, once those words are out of our mouth, we can never put them back in. It's just like this toothpaste. You pretty much could squeeze this and try to suck it up in the tube. You might even get a toothpick or a Q-tip and try to put it back in the tube. But you won't get it back in the tube, will you? No. And the same is true with our words. That once our words are out of our mouths, we can't take them back. So if we say mean and harmful things to other people, we can't take it back. If we are unkind to other people with our words, we can never take it back. And so the Bible tells us we have to be really careful about what we say and try to be like Jesus, who tried to say kind and honest things to people without hurting their feelings. It's hard to do, isn't it? I mean, because just sometimes you want to say stuff, right? But Jesus calls us to try harder. Let's ask for help with that, shall we? 
Dear Jesus, it is hard to make all of our words kind and loving. And we pray, Lord, that when we're not, that you forgive us. But always, Lord, we pray that you'll help us say kind things and not name call. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, you don't get to keep that. <laughs> but you can keep this. And when you brush your teeth, remember that the words that come out of your mouth are very important. So make them kind and loving, okay? Thanks, JJ. Molly and I are going to be smelling toothpaste up here all morning now. <laughs> How many of you remember Cary Grant? There you go. Famous movie star was walking down the street in New York one afternoon when he was spotted by a man who excitedly did that whole stop and stare and double take and stare again and stammer. And he said to Cary Grant, he said, you're, you're Rock Hudson. <laughs> And then he said, no, 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 that's not right. But you're, 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 you're Gary Cooper. And then he said, no, 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 that's not right either. Burt Lancaster. And, no, that's not right. That's not right. So trying to help the man out, Cary Grant said to him, Cary Grant? And the man looked at him and he said, no, that's not right either. <laughs> Today's gospel turns on a question of identity. Who is Jesus? It's pretty clear that the Gospel writer Mark wants us to know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, the Savior, the Christ. And he wants us to know that Jesus' identity as Christ, the Messiah, has implications for the disciples that they did not want to hear. Suffer? Die? No way. So Peter takes Jesus aside when Jesus says this is what's going to happen to him and he says to him, now listen Jesus, that's not what's going to happen. It's like that movie fan and Cary Grant. Peter presumes to know better than Jesus who Jesus is. And Jesus' response to Peter carries us deeper into the mysteries of identity, suffering and death self-denial and cross-bearing. When Jesus asks Peter the question, who do you say that I am? It's not just a question for Peter and the disciples or even the folks they encounter. It's also for us. If Jesus is the Christ, what does that mean for us? If I told you to pull out a piece of paper and write on it who you say Jesus is, what would you write? Who do you say Jesus is? The Messiah? Savior. The Savior? What? Everything. Everything. Yeah. We all have some answer. And, and if I said to you picture who Jesus is, I'm sure you have some images that come to mind right away. Um, they might be the ones you learned in Sunday school of Jesus in the manger, or Jesus holding a little lamb. But is he a teacher? And if so, what kind of teacher? And if he is a savior, what is he saving us from? And if he is a healer, how does he heal us? Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? is ultimately a question for every believer to have an answer one way or the other. But I want to take you back a little bit, and I want to help you understand this question in the context in which Jesus lived. I want you to appreciate the cultural considerations that make Jesus' question one that is a very wide open question rather than a question looking for the right answer. Here's what I mean. People of cultures around the Mediterranean in the first century when Jesus lived had what anthropologists call a dyadic personality. 
And what I mean by dyadic personality is that a person's sense of identity is not like the individualized and internalized sense of identity that our culture experiences. Instead, it was essentially the sum of perceptions that were fed back to you. Now, the closest analogy I, I could think of um, to, to make this clear to you is, is the I identity of the leader in this saying. So here's the saying. If nobody's following you, you're not a leader. You're just taking a walk. In other words, you may think you're a leader, but if no one follows you, well then, you're not a leader, right? In first century Palestine, when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? He is gathering information that tells him who he is in this world, not who he thinks he is. Take that one step further. As followers of Jesus, as modern-day Christians, we are Jesus' presence in the world. So who Jesus is to other people will be the sum of what you and I say with our whole lives about who Jesus is. That means how we act and what we say and our relationship with others will indicate to them who Jesus is because of us. Our words and our actions tell the story of Jesus to other people. Now that may seem complex, but it rolls right into Jesus talking about those who follow him. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. So to be a Christ-bearer means that we are also cross-bearers. But what does that mean? I don't know if you remember the comedian uh, Yakov Smirnov. When he first came to the United States from Russia, he was not prepared for the incredible variety of instant products that were available in American grocery stores. So in his comedy routine, he says this, on my first shopping trip to a grocery store, I saw powdered milk. You just add water and you get milk. And then I saw powdered orange juice. You just add water and you get orange juice. And then I saw baby powder, and I thought to myself, wow, what a country. <laughs> He's joking, of course, but we make these assumptions about being Christians. We think that people change instantly when they become followers of Jesus. According to that belief, when someone gives his or her life over to Jesus, there's an immediate, substantive, in-depth, miraculous change in habits, attitudes, and character. They are powdered Christians. Just add water, and you get a follower of Jesus. But it just isn't that easy, is it? Or Jesus never would have used the analogy of carrying a cross. I hear people say all the time, I guess that's just the cross I have to bear. And generally they say it with a poor, pitiful, woe is me kind of voice. But is that really cross bearing? I don't think so. Cross bearing does not refer to meaningless or even involuntary, involuntary suffering that we must endure. Suffering terminal cancer or arthritis is a horrible misfortune. But it's not bearing a cross like Jesus is talking about. But if you offer your cancer-ridden or your arthritis-weakened self by reaching out to others and helping them, that's cross-bearing. Bearing our cross is a choice. It is a voluntary form of sacrificial obedience that identifies us completely with Jesus. 
bearing our crosses, not making the best of a situation or a circumstance. It is something that we deliberately pick up and carry. And the truth is, most of us would rather wear a cross than carry a cross. There are many beautiful stories that come out of the tragedy of the fall of the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, 23 years ago this past Wednesday. This is the story of Ron Fazio, a vice president of a company on the 99th floor of Tower 2. When the plane slammed into Tower 1, Ron Fazio made one of the best decisions in his life. He ordered all of his employees to evacuate the building. Even though the South Tower, where their offices were, had not yet been hit by the second plane, he insisted that his employees get away from the window, leave their desks, and get out of the building on the 99th floor. He stood there and he held the door open, yelling for everyone to hurry, and held the door open until everyone from his company started down the stairs. They made it far enough so that when the second tower was hit, they were below the impact. And every one of his employees made it out, and so did he. But he remained outside Tower 2, holding the door open of the building and talking on his cell phone as he encouraged people to get out. The last anyone saw of him, he was giving his cell phone to someone else, after which the tower collapsed and Ron Fazio was never seen again. Ron's wife Janet and their kids started a nonprofit foundation to honor their father's heroism. They called it Hold the Door for Others. In his son's word, he said, my dad was a quiet, humble man who died after holding the door open for others. As a family, we're trying to do the same thing, to help people move through their pain so they can begin to dream again. That's the difference between wearing a cross and bearing a cross. Now I have to say I'm not against wearing crosses because I'm wearing one right now. But I am against wearing one if you've never thought through the sacrifice that that cross represents and the sacrifice that we're expected to make when we wear it. Because in a sense, this cross represents Jesus holding the door open so we can walk through it toward life. So we're back to the question Jesus asked the disciples. Who do people say that I am? And we know the answer. The Messiah, the Savior, the Healer, the Teacher, the Guide, the Friend, the Comforter, the Strength, and so on and so on. But then he goes on to say, and who do you say that I am? And if we claim to be Christians, to be Christ followers, then who Jesus is should be reflected in our lives of cross-bearing. Jesus is the one who loves his enemies. He forgives endlessly. He turns the other cheek. He walks the extra mile. He feeds the hungry and gives drinks to the thirsty. He accepts people for who they are. He calls people to accountability, and he challenges the status quo. He lifts up children and women and those who are left out. He does not walk away from confrontation, and he does not belittle people. He touches the lepers. He eats with sinners. He goes off to pray. Now as Christians, is that who we are? Because that's what I think Jesus is getting at when he calls us to bear the cross, to lose our lives so that we can gain our lives. And if we are followers of Jesus, our lives will look like that because we bear that cross. Amen.
please join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the Church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. We pray for the Church throughout the world. Form us into communities of forgiveness and grace. Help us to notice where you are calling us into new relationships and give us courage to embrace the uncomfortable and unfamiliar. Hear us, O God. We pray for the earth and all its inhabitants. Protect lands at risk of wildfire and heal dying forests. Where fire brings destruction, raise up new growth. Guide us in tending precarious ecosystems. Hear us, O God. We pray for those who govern nations, tribes, and cities. Open them to the cries of people in need. Direct them in shaping policies that prioritize the health and well-being of all who struggle, struggle with hunger and housing security. Hear us, O God. We pray for all who are ill, all who are lonely or anxious, and all who grieve. Draw them close to you and soothe them with the promise of your enduring love. Today we lift up Tom, Valerie, Pastor Michael, Nancy, Artie, Dick, Ron, Phyllis, Jim, Bob, Deb, Shirley, Gail, Bob, Jim, Jen, Rachel, Judy, Diane, Roger, Cheryl, Hope, Pat, Nikki, Megan, Brenda, Barbara, Sarah, and those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O God. We pray for teachers, professors, librarians, school administrators, staff, and all who support the education of young people. Sustain them as they shape learning communities rooted in equity and authenticity. We pray for children of all ages in their learning. Hear us, O God. We remember our beloved dead, who with the great cloud of witnesses bear witness to your saving grace. Accompany us in our pilgrimage of faith, that we too place our hope and trust in you. Hear us, O God. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, Holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share those words of peace with each other.
us pray. <coughs> Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again. We give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be our honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as our Lord taught. Our Amen. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus welcomes you to this table. Come 
Here is your God.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this earthly pilgrimage with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to do kindness. Shower abundant hospitality on friend and stranger. Walk in justice so that you might be on the path of mercy and love. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.
Go in peace, follow Jesus, and please stay for the annual meeting. Amen.